Lord. Amen. But it is just so exciting to be here with you all this morning, family. Amen. I know that we have some visitors this morning, and we want to welcome you this morning, but we're going to talk about some family business. Amen. And once you come through the door, you're considered family, so you'll be all right. Amen. Praise God. So um, there's an announcement that did not make <clears throat> the video update, and that announcement is for me. <laughs> Um, I told myself I wasn't going to cry. So, um, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so, um, uh, the series we're going through <laughs> has really healed me. Um, I was in a really dark place for years. And uh, even though I would come to church and do what I had to do and put on my smile, there was something that was eating the living daylights out of me. And uh, I'm the one that will tell it like it is, okay? We are, me and Pastor are total opposites. <laughs> and um, as this, this uh, story began to unfold and Pastor began to preach it, I've heard it over and over and over, but for this time, you know how you can hear something and then you can hear something? So for me, I really heard something in this word as I was studying along with Pastor, and I was like, we can't leave this. I said, there's so much in it because it was a direct reflection of where I was in my life. And I believe it's a direct reflection of us as a corporate body of where we are. And so um, as he was studying and he got that invitation to Hawaii, I was like, oh, I'm going with you. And he says, no, you're going to bring the message. <laughs> and uh, for the first time, I didn't even, I didn't even think twice about it because I have avoided this pulpit because I wasn't healed and because I didn't want to get up in front of God's people and pretend. I didn't want to get up and, and just say what God says and not be living what God says. So the update for me is that I have been released. Amen. Hallelujah. I have been healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The reproach of Egypt is no more for me. You know, I am a movie buff, and my favorite movie is The Color Purple. And the only way I can explain this is, you remember when Sophia knocked the living daylights out of Millie, the mayor's wife? <laughs> and, she got, and she went to jail for all that time. And when she came out, she was sitting at that family table, sitting in that jail, sitting in that jail. <laughs> and she says, I'm back. Sophia's back. And that's how I feel. I feel free. Amen. I feel released. I feel able to move forward because we are a family. Amen. God gives us spiritual fathers and he gives us spiritual mothers. And I know that I have not been in my place, but today the Lord has restored me and I am back in my place. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to, to the almighty God. So my prayer as we move forward, is that we all get healed. <laughs> Amen. You know, it takes a minute. Restoration is 19 years old. We are still adolescents, okay? <laughs> we are in our teen years. We think we know everything. You can't tell us nothing. But really, we are just spiritually adolescents. But God wants to grow us up. And this word this morning, I really believe, is going to just help free you. I pray that it helps free you as it has freed me. So, Father, as we come to your throne this morning, God, we thank you. Oh, my goodness, God, we thank you. Father, as I stand before your people, Lord, Lord, just wash me. God, just remove all of me, Lord, and allow what you have poured into me to come forth, God, so that we can be healed, Father, so that we can move forward, Lord, <laughs> That so that we can conquer our land and walk into our destiny, Lord. 
God, we thank you. We praise you, God. And we love you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So praise God for, for those who don't know me. I am crazy. Woo! I am the crazy one. <laughs> you know, Pastor and I, we are so, so opposite. I mean, I, sometimes I just don't even know how in the world God, God thought, you know, I guess he was just thinking like it's a trap because it, we are, we are just total opposites. Last night he was talking to me and I'm sitting on the phone like, (laughs) okay, okay. (laughs) But one of my problems is that I don't like instructions and he's instructing me and I'm sitting on the phone like, (laughs) you know, and that's just one of the things that God is really dealing with me on because, you know, I grew up in a home with a mother and father. We all grew up in homes, amen. We had parents or adults that took care of us. And, you know, growing up, you get to that age where you don't want to be told nothing. Like, you think you know everything. And so um, just, um, just because we're so much opposites, and he's a, he's a teacher more than a preacher. He really teaches, and everything for me to, for him is like a teaching moment. And it just drives me insane. I'm just like, oh, will you please be quiet? But in all of that over the years, I have really understood that where God is bringing, where God is trying to get me to. And it's just the instrument that he's using to get get me there that was just getting on my nerves. And so I was just, as I was just um, reflecting back over what God has done, you know, in my life and what he wants to do in this house. We have spiritual mothers and we have spiritual fathers. Amen. We have elders. We have people that God has placed over us. Uh, to help us along the way, to teach us, and to mentor us, and to get us to that place where we need to be. But let's be honest, we don't, we don't like instructions, amen? We come from varying backgrounds, different upbringings, different ethnicities, different um, denominations, and so we know it all, because we, you know, some of us have grown up like me. You've grown up in church, so you know, that's not the way I did it. I don't want to change. I don't want to do this. I don't want to sing that song. We, we, we rebel against the man and woman of God. You rebel against the spirit of God because we see it one way, but God is showing them another way. And so then we have all these opinions and we have all these clashes and arguments that are going on. So this is what really was happening with the Israelites. Now we, we understand, and if you did not listen to the series, I, I beg you go back and listen to them. It's a wonderful wonderful series of of what these Israelites were going through. But as the Israelites had left Egypt, got to Kadesh Burnham, acted a fool, God got mad. Oh, when they built the golden calf, God was just done. He was like, he sent out the spies and they went out, the 12 went out, only two came back with a good report, but they chose the majority. (laughs) They chose to the fear came in them, and they chose, like, we're just go, we going to stay here. We're good. They built the golden calf. They began to worship this golden calf, and we're going back to Egypt. We're, you know, we, we, liked, we liked what yesterday looked like. And so God got mad, and God said, okay, I got you. They had been out there 40 days, and God said, okay, for these 40 days, I'm going to add another year to, every four, uh, to this 40, and y'all going to wander for 40 years. So for 40 years, they wandered in the desert, just having to eat manna. I was just, I was just thinking this morning, how in the world could you just eat manna every day, <laughs> you know? But it was the sustenance that God had given them. It was a blessing, but for me, it would have been a curse because I'd be like, I am sick of this manna right here. But God protected them the whole way, but his wrath was burning. And so all of them had to die. All the older generation had to die off because God was like, I am not going to allow you to go into the promise because you have, you have offended me. You have built a golden calf. You have mocked my name. And so all of them had to die off. So we pick up in Joshua chapter 5, and we uh, see the process of the circumcision at Gilgal. And pastor spoke about that all last week, all throughout his sermon, he was speaking about um, dealing with the reproach of Egypt. And so, let me get my notes together here. I'm missing my first page. Here we go. I'm sorry. So, uh, we talked about 
them crossing the, the Jordan River. Um, and the Jordan River is, it was a deep cavern. It was, it, the water flowed down from the mountains and it had just dug out this be, deep cavern that just twisted and turned. And the snowfall was so intense and it was so deep. When I was studying, it says that it was almost, it was 12,000, more than 12,000 feet in some points below sea level. So it wasn't just when Pastor was explaining going down the stairs. This was a deep cavern. And the word Jordan means to descend. And so here you have these people that have got this promise, but there's a cavern in front of them. So in order for them to get to their healing, they got to descend. They got to go down. They've got to go into this, this valley that leads that, that the Jordan River eventually made it to the Dead Sea and it dumped into the Dead Sea. So they got to go into this place where dead things move, where all the dead things flow and the dead things drop into the, to the Dead Sea. So they cross this, this, this Jordan River, which was a miracle in itself. Because I'm sure all the Amorites and everybody were looking at them like, they ain't making it over. Yeah, we good. You know, they're, they're not coming across that. But God performs this miracle, and he parts it, get over on the other side. And then after they got over to the other side, a circumcision took place. God began to, to reestablish his covenant with them. And he circumcised every male. And the reason for that circumcision was every male that had been born during that 40 years had not been circumcised. They had gotten so out of place that there was no circumcision, there was no Passover, there was no homage to God. There was, they were just out there wandering. Some, some, some of the uh, commentaries say that, you know, because they had to move from place to place, they never took the time to administer the circumcision to the newborn, but they never did the commandments of God. And those commandments were sent, were given to God, were given to Abraham from God when God had made the promise to Abraham that your seed will be like the stars. It'll be like the sands of the beach. I am going to make a nation out of you. And so, <clears throat> and so these children are here and God's getting ready to restore their promise. And I'm not sure that they realized what was about to happen, but God begins to circumcise every male. And so we end up in chapter, in chapter 5 and verse 8, and this is where it really just caught me. Um, because chapter, I'm going to start at verse 7 in chapter 5 of Joshua says, So they raised up their sons in their place, and these were the, son, the ones Joshua was circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. That phrase just grabbed me, until they were healed. <laughs> so that is a prepositional phrase with a conjunction, and it means it's used as a function, a word to indicate as of an action or condition for a specific time. So until we were healed meant that there was a time frame that was going to take place before they could walk into their promised land. Church, we need to be healed. Amen. Amen. We have, we have talked about crossing over. We're going to take the land. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And God's like, y'all ain't even done with the circumcision yet. <laughs> You're not healed. So today, we need to understand that before we can really reap the promises of God, that we need to sit and be healed. So this morning, I want to just encourage you, remain in your place until you have been healed. Now, I pray it don't take as long as it took me, okay, because I said I'm trifling. But <laughs> do not move forward until you know that you are healed. So we have here a situation where they are just miles away from Jericho. God has already given Joshua the instructions of what he's going to do. And Joshua's army, these men of God, the same people that were going to fight with him, he had to cut them. 
Whew. So in that cutting, it meant that he had to go out and give instructions to them. He had to remove some things and adjust some things because God was doing something. And so as we move forward as a ministry, there's got to be some cutting away. There's got to be some adjustments. And we need to understand that God is orchestrating this. This is not Pastor Gilbert. This is not the elders. But God is orchestrating it. God is saying there's some things that we need to adjust. So as we sit at, at the bank, as we sit and we, and we get healed, don't view the cutting away as you're not worthy or you can't do this or you can't do that. Don't ever let someone tell you what God can't do for you. But always allow, to, always allow adjustment, amen? Always allow correction. You know, when you were a child growing up and, you know, in, in my culture, <laughs> we didn't get spankings. <laughs> we got beat, okay? <laughs> and, you know, when your mother, when you had done something wrong, and this is my mama, go get me a switch. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, that you had to go because you knew that discipline is coming because you knew something had happened. <laughs> you know, you had done something wrong, and you knew that I'm getting ready to get a whipping. I'm getting ready to get beat. Um, and the fear that came over you, the anticipation as you sat in your room, <laughs> you started crying before the whipping even got there. And when she came in and she adjusted you and you begging and she beating you, I told you, <laughs> you know, that's the kind of beatings I experienced growing up. Whether it was a switch, a belt, a shoe, an extension cord, whatever. My mother did not play. But now, you know, when I was young, I said, I am never ever going to treat my kids like you treat me, you know, that's just, I'm not going to do it. I'm not, I'm not, you know, you don't have to be so mean. And I grew up and had kids and Eddie made a video. If you've been here long enough, you didn't see the video Eddie used to make, has made about, <laughs> about the disciplines, but God is going to discipline us. And whether it comes from his hand or another, we have to understand that he's doing it for our good that he's doing it because he loves you. About, you know, when you, after the spanking, you know I love you, right? You know I had to spank you because I love you. Well, it didn't feel like love. So as we're sitting at this bank and as we're getting healed, we have to understand that circumcision prepares us for our future, amen? And God is wanting to prepare us. God is wanting to push us forward to move us into our future. Uh, but our obedience is key to our healing, and so one of the things we need to do while we are sitting at the bank, at the shore, we can see Jericho. All you got to do is walk out the door and look to your right, and it's right there. Our land is right there. But when you walk out and see it, make sure that your heart is ready to receive it. Amen? To receive everything God has. I have two questions. Are you prepared to move? And can you be trusted in the move. Can God trust you with a blessing that he's about to bestow upon you? Can he trust you this morning? So at the bank, let's talk about the bank. Let's talk about the camp. Ooh, the camp is a hot mess. I'm sure the camp was a hot mess because first of all, you didn't got cut. Second of all, there's all this reproach and all this shame, but God had removed it. God has said, you know, today I remove the reproach of Egypt. Today, your past is gone. It is erased, and I'm ready to restore you. So as you sit at that, as you, when you sit at that bank, when you sit in that place of, of healing, I'm telling you, there's all kinds of situations going on in that, in that camp. There's that woman who has a spirit of Jezebel, who's been hurt by a man, who is just evil and wants to, to uh, castrate that's, just go back in your, in your Bible and begin to read. There's, there's all kinds of situations, all kinds of spirits, all kinds of issues at the bank. There's Shimei, the guy who, uh, when David was going back into the city and he cursed David from the, throughout the whole parade, he was telling me, you're not worthy. Make sure whatever you're dealing with, Whatever spirit, whatever, whatever is causing you. There was Ananiah and, and uh, Sapphira who lied before the Lord. 
you can just look. There was Absalom, who was so jealous of David because he felt like he should have got the throne, that he stood at the gate and he, he was just mimicking and mocking God and, and just filling out all kinds of, of foulness against the Lord and what God was doing. But the Lord's reproach is not to be messed with. God will, he, he can take you out, you know. Amen that we live in um, A.D. and not B.C. Because at B.C. he was like, ping. I mean, people were just, they were just dropping dead. He was not playing. And, you know, I'm, I always laugh and say, boy, if I lived in A.D., I would no longer, uh, in B.C., I would no longer be. Because God been like, I am done with your foolishness. Boop. And so we have to be careful of what we're doing and how we're healing. When you're healing, it's not for you to sit up there and just throw up on somebody else. Because you know what that does? They, they take on your pain, and you take on their pain. And then we get this, we, it just becomes a mess. So as we're sitting at that camp, and we are healing, God is healing us in this place. I'm telling you, God is moving us, and the shift is coming. And we want to be prepared for what God has for us. So we have to destroy the golden calves of our lives. Amen. Uh, the first generation of Israelites, they built this calf and they worshiped this calf. But God said, oh, you can't come in. So if you have a golden calf, I'm going to tell you right now, that is, that is, yo, that is going, that you don't get an entry ticket, okay? You don't get to come in. Your golden calf could be that sin situation. It could be that husband. It could be that wife. The golden calf is something that you worship more than you worship God. The golden calf is that thing that you have replaced God with. So we have to make sure that we have destroyed our golden calf. That means our sins. That means, God, you know, this is my issue. You know I like this. You know, God says, I'm going to roll that away. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to heal you, but you've got to walk it out. So we have to understand that our golden calves, God has removed them. Amen. One of the things as Christians that we've got to understand is that we have to be forgiving and we have to forgive ourselves. We cannot handle each other's sins. We can't. And oh my gosh, if the man of God or the woman of God sins, I mean, it's like, what? You know, and I'm like, we are just as human as you. We fail. We mess up. We don't hear God. But God is saying, I'm building a family, I'm building a body, I'm building a unit. And we have to understand that we're going to stumble, that when we cross over, it's not going to be pretty, it's not going to be perfect, because sin resides in us. But along with the sin that resides in us is the Spirit of God, is the everlasting <laughs> blood of Jesus Christ. So we've got to learn to not walk in our flesh, hallelujah, but walk in the spirit. So when you see a brother slip, when you see a brother fall, it's not for you to get on the phone. It's not for you to, to talk about, but it's for you to get in there and get on your knees and begin to intercede and begin to put your arms around them and begin to love them. Amen. Because even at Gilgal, after the circumcision, God was with them the entire time. The entire way God walked through him, he, he knew that they were in pain. He knew that they were hurting, but I, he wanted them to know it's no more. It's no more. So we, we must renew our covenant with God. And even during the circumcision, after each man had been cut, after each man was going through a healing period, the Lord was with them. Three days later, if you continue to read on, the Lord prepared for them to partake of the Passover, another ritual that had not been done in 40 years. Another thing that had been pushed aside because of the sins of the forefathers. So this new generation was now able to come to the table. Amen. So you can come to the table and they were still hurting. I can guarantee you they were still sore. They were limping. They were making their way into the presence of God, and God invited them to the table. Amen. God will not neglect you. God invites us to the table this morning. God invites us to reinstate the covenant, to take of the Passover. Amen. And he, feed, he fed them 
they had, it was not manna, they had some meat, amen. They had slaughtered the lambs, they had the fruit of the land, they had everything God had promised. God nourished them, God restored them, and God wants to restore us. Everyone that comes through this door really needs to understand what the, what the spirit of this house is. The spirit of this house is restoration, amen? If you knew, and some of you know, but I mean, if you really knew the other side of the story, of what me and Pastor had gone through, you would appreciate more what God does in this place. Because of the restoration of our marriage, the restoration of, of our family, God spoke many, many years ago, and he told us, he said, uh, and this is when we were at another uh, ministry, God said, God is building a house, and he said, I just keep hearing the word restoration, restoration. He says, you all are going to be a place where wounded soldiers will come and find rest, where wounded people will come and be healed, amen? Where people who have been on the battlefield in ministry have been hurt, have been just ripped apart. He says, they will come and they will rest and they will get healed, and they will go back and conquer the land. Amen? So it doesn't matter for me when I see people come and go because I'm like, praise God. Maybe they've gotten their restoration. Maybe they're healed. Maybe God is sending them forth. So when we see people leaving the ministry and we get all uptight, well, what's going on? Why are they leaving? You know, and then, gee, 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 gee. oh, my goodness. Maybe God is done. Maybe God has, has moved them. Maybe God has restored them. Maybe their ministry, maybe it was just a pit stop, amen, for them to get healed, for them to be loved on. Because you can't tell, they can't tell me that they weren't loved on while here. Now, of course, we're going to fight because we family. Everybody got brothers and sisters and cousins, and we fight. Hello. <laughs> I mean, we disagree, we argue, but at the same time, we love. So God is bringing us back into a covenant relationship with him where we can really just get to know each other, and we can love, and we can look beyond our faults. So we must remain in your place, amen? Remain in your place until you are healed. God did it to test their faith, amen? God was like, okay, y'all didn't crossed over. And you would have thought, you know, we crossed over, let's go take our land. God was like, no, uh-uh, you crossed over, I need to heal you, I need to re-engage with you. He says, because I'm a, I'm a personal person. God, is a, God wants a personal relationship with you. And he healed them, and he wanted them to know, I am God, and today I am restoring my covenant with you. So God just began to just, everyone I know just felt his presence in that place as they were being healed. God did it, and he removed, he did the circumcision. It was a test, like, I'm going to cut you, and I'm going to see if you stay. I'm going to cut you and see if you run back across the Jordan or if you're going to stay and you're going to get healed and you're going to wait it out. So this is such a reflection for, to me of where we are at. Amen. God is getting ready to do some wonderful things in this place, not just for the church, but for your own personal lives. If you just when you get a chance, just read <laughs> the rest of the story, and you will see where they failed again. You will see where they were blessed again. You will see where people found where they, their place in God. God wants to do the same for us here. And so we've got to encourage each other. I just want to encourage you this morning. As we begin to make this shift, God's in control. Amen. Just as that Joshua had, like, I don't know, millions of people, bless the Lord. It was millions of people that God had called him to lead. And it wasn't always easy. I'm sure he heard some pushback and some flack, but they became obedient to what God was doing. You see, God gives a vision to the man of God, amen? And he's given us the full vision, I mean... Eyes have not seen and ears have not heard of what God's going to do in this place. And our position is to get behind our pastor, amen? It's to get behind our pastor and understand, okay, I know that you're following Christ. 
and I am going to follow you as you follow Christ. It's not for us to judge. It's not for us to, to question, but it's for us to just be obedient. It's a test from God. Who will believe what God has said? Amen. And so as Joshua is leading these men, I mean, he had armies of men. He had to give them direction. He had to bring on a staff, so to speak, because the vision was so great that not one man could do it. He needed a staff, and that's where we're at at Restoration. Amen? We are at a place to where we started this thing in our home (laughs) with 16 people. Look where God has brought us from. Amen? We can no longer run restoration like a mom and pop shop. It just ain't working no more, okay? (laughs) It's just too many people. There's too many things going on in the ministry. And so when pastor says, we need help, we are at the point to where we love our volunteers. Thank you so much. But we have got to get to the point to where we have a staff an army, so to speak, just like Joshua said, let me, let, me, let me get some men to run this. We've got to get an army. We've got to staff up and get ready because one man cannot carry this load from his set for, by himself. So as we look for that executive pastor, we look to fill those positions so you don't have to call the church and say, they are ignoring me. Pastor ain't returned my call. <laughs> I mean, we are one, <laughs> he's one man, he's just one man. And so when we bring on and we, we, we spread our, our, our tent pegs, we will have a staff that is available because I'm telling you, there's a crossing over. You've crossed over and there's more to cross over, amen? There are those that are on their journey. There are those that want to get away from the reproach of Egypt and God is bringing them to the house of restoration to be healed. Amen. So we have got to be in place. You know, it doesn't matter to me whether I am mopping a floor or scrubbing a toilet. I just want to be in God's house. I just want to be where God has called me to be. I don't want, I don't care about, you know, oh, that's the pastor's wife. My name is Katani. Hello. I am just as real as you. My feelings get hurt. I love you. I mean, I have the same thing. We are not, you know, to be put on a pedestal. We got put on a pedestal once, and that's why we got on restoration. Amen? (laughs) But you've got to understand that the men and women of God are being led by God to do a work. And as we all come together, we will forget. We will not forget Egypt, but we will know that the reproach of Egypt has been removed. How many of you want the reproach of Egypt removed. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you willing to get circumcised? Are you willing to get shifted? Are you willing to to see what God is going to do? And that might mean that he might have to adjust you. That might mean that he might have to tweak you or he might need to move you into another part of ministry. One thing we we don't want to do is cross over with with the same attitude. This is my mic. I've been on this worship team for so many years. Uh, no, I am not giving up this microphone. I, I helped build this church. That wall over there, I helped drywall. You know, we don't want to come in carrying our past. When you carry your past and you spew that out, you're literally throwing up on the younger generation. You're, re- you're really bringing a reproach upon them. And then they get an attitude like, okay, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know you was all that. Ain't nobody in here all that. The only person that is all that is Jesus Christ. Amen. And God wants us to move forward. So we've got to let go of our past and whether in whatever way, shape, or form, get ready. Because if you don't, if you don't get healed, God gonna cut you and He's gonna heal it before you, and the whole body will know. So it's best for you to sit there and heal before your business gets put out in the street. I'm a witness. When God says, stop it. Stop it. And when you don't stop it, bloop, he will just put your business out there. And then you have to sit there and recover in front of everybody and be humiliated in front of everybody. And God doesn't want to humiliate you. But when you're hard-headed like I was, God's like, okay, okay, I got you. And he just, he just put it on blast. So we don't want to be put on blast, amen. But if you do get put on blast, like me, you will recover, amen. <laughs> you will be okay. <laughs> 
I think for me, getting it put on blast was what pushed me into his presence. Because growing up, in, you know, practically being born on the back pew of a church, I knew church. I knew people. I knew the scriptures like the back of my hands. I didn't know who God was. And he had to knock me down on my behind so I could look up and see who he was, develop a personal relationship with him, go through the healing process so I can stand here today and be a witness to you that God can restore. Amen? So when you're healing, God is still working on your behalf. He is preparing the Passover meal and inviting you to the table. And even while you're hurting, he is still working behind the scenes. After they partook of this Passover meal, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joshua. And he began to instruct them on how to conquer the land. There is an angel assigned to each of us. There is an angel over this house of restoration. And he's waiting for us to get healed, to be restored, so he can give us the instructions on how to take the land. That angel has been here many times, I'm telling you. He has been here throughout our ministry. We were in the parking lot in a tent <laughs> worshiping the Lord. And pastor got struck with cancer. Huh. Everything, I mean, we had put all our little dimes and nickels together to get in here. And the city came and said, nope, you're not ready to occupy it. So we ended up being in a tent. And then pastor got sick with cancer. When that doctor told me that he had cancer, something just came over me like, mm, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, of course, I was scared. I was worried. It was just like, What? But during that whole process, I could just hear the angel of the Lord telling me, we got this. We got this. Don't worry. Don't, don't trip. We got this. And so I remember when they were going to roll him into surgery. They's like, Mr. Gilbert, you have cancer. It has erupted in your colon. And if we don't get, operate on you immediately, you will not live. You have just a few more hours. So me and Pastor Elder Bob... And uh, at the time, Salt were in there um, with Pastor, and we were just sitting there like, what? And as we were sitting there, Pastor was sitting, on, laying in the bed, and he told, he said, Katani, Katani, look. And he was looking at the door, and he said, do you see that black cloud coming in? He said, there's a black cloud coming into the door. And I'm looking like, you tripping. Um, and so he's just like persistent. No, seriously, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a presence, a black presence coming into the door. And then he said, oh, my goodness. And he said, a white, beautiful angel came in, and the cloud just, the black cloud just removed, and an angel stood before him. And he just stood there and looked, and I'm looking, and Bob's looking, and we're like, okay, did the drugs kick in? You know, and that's where I was because I was not in a spiritual mindset. I was like, okay, he, he a little bit high. And he's like, and the whole way out, he's talking about, do you see? We're rolling him down the thing, and he's like, the angel's right here. The angel's right here. And so when he went into the surgery, and after all of that, I was in his room when they told me he had, he had coded three times, and the doctor was like, he's out. <laughs> he gone. <laughs> And so, you know, I just looked at the doctor because I always smile. I mean, you know, that you can tell me bad news and I'll just be there smiling because I know what God can do. And as he told me that, I just stood there and the angel of the Lord spoke to me and said, I got work for you all to do. He's going to be fine. He will be fine. And so we had to cross that Jordan, okay? We had to go into the depth of the Jordan. But when God brought us out, he said, this is your promise. So this morning, know that God has a promise for you. Amen. That God wants to restore you. That God, all the things that God whispers in your ear. And if you can't hear his voice, develop a worship life. Develop your personal relationship. Because God is going to fight our battles. In Romans 6 and 2, it says, we died to sin. In 1 Corinthians 
chapter 6, it says, we are washed and we are sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. In Galatians 2 and 20, we have been crucified with Christ. No longer do I live, but the Christ that lives within me. That's the circumcision of the heart. You know, we look at circumcision, and it is for male, but what God is talking about is that in Romans, he talks about the circumcision of the heart. I need to cut away from you. I need to cu cut away those attitudes, those feelings, and those thoughts for you. God wants to circumcise your heart. In, Deuteron in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Even in our best our hearts will deceive us. It will be wicked. It will cause us to do things that we, are, we will step back and think like, what did I just do? When your heart is leading you, make sure that it is circumcised. Amen? Make sure that God has your heart in his hands because you will mess up and you will do some crazy things even as a Christian, even as a blood-bought believer, you will find yourself in situations where you look back like, how in the world did I get here? Because your heart will deceive you. But if in Romans, it talks about circumcising the heart, dying daily to God, amen? Knowing that God is alive, <laughs> knowing that God wants to do what he said he will do. When we understand that this, this battle that we are in is not flesh and blood. It's not who, you know, when we jockey in for positions and we're trying to figure out how we're going to move and what we're going to do and who's going to be the boss and who's going to get this position and who is this new executive pastor and who is this and who is, that is a physical war, okay? That's, that's you in your physical. But when you look in Ephesians 6 and 20, it says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We've got to stop fighting amongst each other. And we've got to understand that the root of our problem is in the, it's in the uh, spiritual realm. That there is a war going on and that Satan wants to take us out. Do you think Satan wants us? I mean, come on. Do you think Satan wants to see that building? Do you think Satan wants to see that gymnasium? Do you want Satan to see all the ministries that is about to be built? No. And the only way he can stop it is if we are sitting at the bank, call ourselves healing and arguing at the same time. We are fighting a spiritual war. Amen. You need to understand that you are flesh and you are spirit. And you have got to learn how to allow the spirit man to take control and to take over. Jesus was the, was the prime example. Oh, he, but he was God. But he was also man. And he came down. And even at, at the point of death, he said, oh, my God, please take this cup from me. Please. Is there any other way we can get through this? But nevertheless, he said, not my will, but your will be done. Let's vow to have God's will done on here because Jesus went and was the ultimate circumcision for us when he cast our sins away, when he rose again from the dead. He gave us victory. Learn to walk in your victory. Learn to heal. Learn to sit. Learn to wait and be obedient and watch what God's going to do. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord. Glory to your name. Amen. Amen. Can we just stand? Hallelujah. Just continue to give him praise. Hallelujah. I hope that this message has, has just lightened your heart. Amen. Just to know, hey, my pastors aren't perfect. They real. Hallelujah. And they have seen the hand of God move. And as we move forward in ministry, I am so excited about what God is going to do in the lives of, these, of, of, of us. God's going to heal. <laughs> There's going to be miraculous signs. Those Jericho walls are going to fall down. Everybody's like, how are we going to get the money? How are we going to do this? We walked in here with zero dollars and zero cents, and look where we sit. The land was given to us for free. God is with us. 
Let's not worry about the outcome. Let's just worry about, God, what do you need me to do to get there? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We just want to open up this altar this morning. Maybe you are still dealing with the reproach of Egypt. Maybe you are still dealing with the shame of your past. Maybe you're dealing with some issues in your life that you just can't seem to get breakthrough. This morning, God is saying, sit and wait. Amen. On Calvary, he shed his blood. Your sins were forgiven. Your issues were forgiven. It is you who choose to keep rolling the tape back and remembering what God, or remembering of that hardship, remembering of that pain. You know, when you were a kid and you would scrape your knee or hurt and the scab would start forming and you pick the scab and then you pick the scab again and, and you never allowed the healing to take place, God is saying, quit picking on the scab. Take the time to let it heal this morning. Amen. So as we go into the presence of the Lord, if you want to come up for prayer this morning, you just want to know God. Amen. You just want to get that relationship right. You want to be obedient. You want to ask for forgiveness. You want to say, God, forgive me. I have messed up and I don't want to be the one left that can't steal healing, but I want to march with the army as they take Jericho. Then come this morning. Amen. Come this morning. Hallelujah. Come this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. If the worship team could come on up. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father God, we worship you. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this place, God. We thank you for this healing. Oh, God, we love you this morning. Father God, just wash us, Lord. Wash us again and again. God, we thank you that you love us so much because, God, we can be trifling, Lord. <laughs> oh, God, we can just put on our little spiritual faces and come in and just act like everything's okay, God, and go home and return to the reproach. But today you said, I've removed it. I've removed it. So God, bring healing in this place. Hallelujah. Bring deliverance in this place, God. God, settle our minds and settle our hearts to understand that you are doing a new thing. And we have not crossed this way before, Lord. So as we bring on, Father God, the staff that will help us make it into Jericho, Lord, let us be kind, let us be patient, Father God, let us love as you have loved us. We bless you, we bless you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah.